Welcome to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast, where we explore the kind of thinking we need to navigate a positive way forward. I'm your host, Maura Gamble, permaculture educator and global ambassador, filmmaker, eco villager, food forester, mother, practivist, and all round lover of thinking, communicating, and acting regeneratively. For a long time, it's been clear to me that to shift trajectory to a thriving one planet way of life, we first need to shift our thinking. The way we perceive ourselves in relation to nature, self and community is the core. So this is true now more than ever. And even the way change is changing is changing. Unprecedented changes are happening all around us at a rapid pace. So how do we make sense of this? To know which way to turn, to know what action to focus on. So our efforts are worthwhile and nourishing and are working towards resilience, regeneration and reconnection. What better way to make sense than to join together with others in open, generative conversation? In this podcast, I'll share conversations with my friends and colleagues, people who inspire and challenge me in their ways of thinking, connecting and acting. These wonderful people are thinkers, doers, activists, scholars, writers, leaders, farmers, educators, people whose work informs permaculture and spark the imagination of of what a post-COVID, climate resilient, socially just future could look like. Their ideas and projects help us to make sense in this changing world, to compost and digest the ideas and to nurture the fertile ground for new ideas, connections and actions. Together we'll open up conversations in the world of permaculture design, regenerative thinking, community action, earth repair, eco-literacy and much more. I can't wait to share these conversations with you. Over the last three decades of personally making sense of the multiple crises we face, I always return to the practical and positive world of permaculture with its ethics of earth care, people care and fair share. I've seen firsthand how adaptable and responsive it can be in all contexts, from urban to rural, from refugee camps to suburbs. It helps people make sense of what's happening around them and to learn accessible design tools to shape their habitat positively and to contribute to cultural and ecological regeneration. This is why I've created the Permaculture Educators Program to help thousands of people to become permaculture teachers everywhere through an interactive online dual certificate of permaculture design and teaching. We sponsor global perma youth programs, women's self-help groups in the global south and teens in refugee camps. So anyway, this podcast is sponsored by the Permaculture Education Institute and our Permaculture Educators Program. If you'd like to find more about permaculture, I've created a four-part permaculture video series to explain what permaculture is and, and also how you can make it your livelihood as well as your way of life. We'd love to invite you to join our wonderfully inspiring, friendly and supportive global learning community. So I welcome you to share each of these conversations and I'd also like to suggest you create a local conversation circle to explore the ideas shared in each show and discuss together how this makes sense in your local community and environment. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I meet and speak with you today, the Gubby Gubby people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hello friends and welcome to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast where we explore the kind of thinking that can help us navigate a positive way forward. I'm your host Morag Gamble, permaculture educator and global ambassador, filmmaker, eco-villager, author, food forester, mother, practivist and all-round lover of thinking, communicating and acting regeneratively. Unprecedented changes are happening all around us. So how do we make sense of this? To know which way to turn, to know what action to focus on so our efforts are working towards resilience, regeneration and reconnection. What better way to make sense than to join together with others in open, generative conversation? Each week, I speak with a wonderful guest who inspires and challenges me with their ways of thinking. These thinkers, doers, educators, activists, scholars, writers, leaders, farmers, are people whose work informs permaculture and sparks the imagination of what a post-COVID, climate resilient, regenerative and socially just future could look like. Their way of seeing helps us to compost and digest ideas and nurture the fertile ground for new ideas. 
Together, we'll open conversations around permaculture design, regenerative thinking, community action, earth repair, and eco-literacy. This podcast is brought to you by the Permaculture Educators Program of the Permaculture Education Institute. This is an online dual permaculture design and teacher certificate program designed to help you make permaculture your life and your livelihood too, and to help you ripple out permaculture thinking and action in your world and beyond. Last week, I uploaded a little introduction to this Sense Making in a Changing World podcast. And this episode is our first episode with our guest, and I'm speaking with a young regenerative farmer and author, Acadia Tucker from New Hampshire in the USA. If you've not already seen her books, I sincerely encourage you to check them out. They are called Action for Citizen Gardeners Everywhere. Her two books are Growing Good Food, A Citizen's Guide to Backyard Carbon Farming, and Growing Perennial Foods, A Field Guide to Raising Brazilian Fruits, Herbs and Vegetables. I was so delighted to recently catch up with Acadia via Zoom and have this wonderful chat, and I'm really delighted too to be sharing it with you here today. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today, Joel. It's it's such a pleasure to actually have this chance to meet and talk. I've known of your work for a long time and, and um, the work that you do in permaculture and regenerative design. Um, you're the co-founder of, um, well, a founding partner of Regenesis. You've been working in permaculture for decades, uh, setting up something I understand called flowering tree permaculture and working in arid zones. And... Um, you can find a lot of your work in pattern mines. It's a lot of things that I wanted to explore with you about that, particularly around permaculture. What is permaculture for you, uh, particularly around the permaculture mind? Um, I think you're writing a book about permaculture mind at the moment too, I understand. Is that right? Did well, I it's pattern mind. Pattern mind. So yeah. there's these kind of three things I do. There's the permaculture I've done for 30 years or more and all this tracking um, traditional skills and all this regenerative thinking, living systems thinking work. And I realized I was bringing all of them into classes I was teaching, um, whether it was a permaculture course or a tracking course. And, um, there was no name for it. Any. And so I realized that they are all looking at the pattern level of the world instead of all the stuff we see. So in tracking, you don't get stuck on the tracks. You're looking for what is the story it's telling you that left the tracks, right? And it's a kind of non-material view of the world. It's an energetic view of the world. And that we're so stuck in, you know, I, I say, oh, if there's a, it'd be different from you guys, but if there was a wallaby track and you took a stick and you made it into a bigger kangaroo track, it wouldn't turn the wallaby into a kangaroo. But that's the way we treat the world. We that we think that oh, we bring a bulldozer in and change the hill doesn't change the geological processes that we're still engaged in, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have this weird view that if we shift the physical manifestation, that that is how we shift reality. But because we haven't changed the energy flows, it's going to go back to what it was previously. The hill is going to reform in similar ways it was before. Um, and the same thing politically, economically, socially, culturally, it's really how do we change those underlying patterns that transform the physical world in a lasting way? Right? And it's, it's so funny to me, we're stuck in this viral time and that's how viruses work. It's this tiny little information change that changes an underlying pattern and look at the transformations of the world. And so that's how I see permaculture, is that um, I think that was one of Bill's insights. You know, I compare Dave Holmgren's principles to Bill's, Mollison's principles, and Dave's are excellent design principles, and Bill's are all about changing the way you see the world. The problem is the solution, right? Least change for the greatest effect. They're all about how do we look at how do we observe all these things that are going on and find that little inoculation that 
flashes out through the system and transforms. So what you're saying then really is that it's not it's not a big thing that necessarily needs to happen. It's it's mm. this inoculation and it's not a linear thing either. The change doesn't happen incrementally over time. It can just just change like that. So what are those points of inoculation that you've found or what is it how is it that you've noticed when people come in contact with permaculture with the programs that you run that 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 shift is able to happen. How do you help to tend that? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I want to back up for one second and say address this linear thing because mm-hmm. all the patterns we see in nature, whether it's that the rings on the surface of a pond or that logarithmic spiral in the seashell, um, the branching patterns, um, that the rate of change speeds up. It goes faster and faster and faster and faster, right? And that we do not have the time and energy to fix all the ecosystems of the planet and all the soils and all the damaged human beings. But we have the opportunity to harness that way that nature develops um, to transform and regenerate the living world. And I think that's why what you're pointing at is so important is that it's not so important that people in a course, they learn, oh, here's the right way to build a swale, or here's the right way, right? That those are all tools to help people see the world in a different way. Oh, I never thought about, oh, if we cut a ditch on contour, we catch all that water. And even if it rains, you know, this much annually here, we could effectively have you know, two meters worth of water in there if we wanted to, right? That for me, it's that change in the seeing that's really important because then you can say, oh, it's the same with building soil fertility. It's the same with building economic wealth. It's the same with, um, you know, lifting people out of poverty in all these different ways is that it's seeing those patterns of um, a little investment that transforms the pattern or even people's capability um, that grows exponentially. Mm. Mm. So I wonder with the, um, <clears throat> when you're talking about lifting people out of poverty and mm. can you can you just kind of unpack that a little bit more? And a lot of the work that I'm doing at the moment is working with uh, people in refugee camps, for example, and with, with permaculture. Mm-hmm. and helping in that frame shifting to a more sense of abundance mm-hmm. is is what what i see happening um potential uh there seems to be new like just endless possibilities starting to emerge out of out of that i just would love to hear a little bit more about you speak about how how you see permaculture mind or pattern mind helping to address social systems um, and particularly in areas where there's where there's poverty or or maybe even political shifts something like there's a lot of that going on in (laughs) all part of the world at the moment and um it's a it's a huge area and I, i wonder what permaculture from your perspective has to say about that you know that's kind of like very different realms of of, uh, thinking about social systems, but, you know, they're all connected. Yeah, the first one, uh, I was just on a call with some students through Regenesis, um, this organization I helped to co-found some 20-some years ago, um, and the institute that we began just a couple of years ago. We've been doing an educational program for six or eight years um, because people were interested in working with us, learning from us all around the world. And it didn't make any sense to bring everybody together. So we started an online program, just eight or nine sessions, weekly or bi-weekly and an intensive and some coaching in between. And um, it's called the Regenerative Practitioner. So it's people who are already practitioners to kind of bump up their abilities to accomplish. You know, they've, Many of us feel as if we've plateaued. We've accomplished really great things, but not really what we've aimed to. Mm-hmm. And so do we, how do we um, 
develop our abilities so we can actually get beyond that glass ceiling. And we've just completed a series in Rwanda. And um, many of the people are professionals. They're architects, engineers, um, builders, particularly working on governmental projects. And one of the things they're talking about is the government is doing all these excellent projects, largely resettling people who are um, suffering from the impacts of climate change, um, and also trying to provide them with a livelihood. So they're not just getting homes, they're maybe getting some chickens or um, farmland or cattle. And they were talking about how often people will then sell the chickens, sell the cattle, sell the doors and windows and mattresses and bathtubs out of the homes, right? And then go back to the, the government and ask for more. And we were talking about how much of it is because they don't have an ownership in it. They didn't build the house. They didn't raise the chickens. Their neighbor didn't raise the chickens. Um, and it, I am often reminded of my friend, Brad Lancaster, who's written all these books on water harvesting and the like. And he talks about how in front of his house, they caught the water off the street, planted all these edible native plants. It was cooler and shadier. Um, everyone was hanging out there. He got some grant money to do the same thing in the whole block. And he said the most important piece of the design was not the water catchment structures. It wasn't the plant guilds and their relationships to one another. It was the process for implementing it. And the process for implementing it was the people in the street doing it. And it was not just that they learned about water harvesting and the like. It was that they owned it. So mm -hmm. somebody came along and parked their truck on top of the plant. Grandma would run out of the house bang on the truck with her cane. Oh, my granddaughter planted that plant, move your, right? But if the city had done it, she wouldn't have cared or a landscaping company. And it's one of the things we neglect in permaculture in general is we design something and we don't consider the process for implementing it, mm -hmm. right? So that it is creating new capacities, skills, um, all kinds of abilities, um, money going in ways it often usually doesn't go. And I think the kinds of cases you're talking about, you're sort of forced to do that. That so much of permaculture is there's somebody who's got the money and they're going to pay the people to bring in the plants and plant the plants and do the water harvesting and build the beautiful solar straw bale home. Um, and that's wonderful and only goes so far. That if we really want to transform communities, we really have to focus on um, the process. Do you know that that Gregory Bateson story about the new college of Oxford, England? No, I don't think I do. So um, he tells this story, the new college, which was founded some 500, 600 years ago, um, had this great dining hall in it with these massive oak beams that supported the roof. And one of the workers noticed sawdust coming down and went up and dug in with his pen knife and found beetles were riddling these beams. And so he went to his boss and they talked to all these different people and they couldn't figure out where they were going to find the massive oak trees they needed to replace these 500 year old beams. So finally, they called in the forester because the college had forestry lands as part of their endowment. And they asked him, he said, oh, I was wondering when you were going to ask about them trees. And they said, what are you talking about? He said, everybody knows that oak gets beetly in about 500 years. So when they built the college, they planted oaks to replace them. And each forester told the next forester, don't you cut them oaks. Those are to replace the beams in the college. And he says, that's the way you run a culture. So... You don't begin with the architectural design. You begin with um, the forestry or growing the whites or creating whatever it is that is going to end up being the thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's, it's not just it, that. It's we not are just very lucky. The building. the building is the forest as well. It is all of those things simultaneously, even whether everyone sees all the parts of it, but it is. It is all of that. And yeah, it's a, a wonderful way of seeing it and a wonderful way of being. And I, 
you know, I see a little bit of that happening within Crystal Waters. When Crystal Waters, the eco village here that yeah. I live in, was was designed and set up, there was a number of people who also started planting um, forestry areas, um, woodlots on you know parts mm-hmm. of the land that wasn't so great for you know houses or the other parts of growing and and it wasn't the steeper slopes where there was you know natural forest that was never to be cut it was kind of the mid slopes darker side and so they planted them up with with Mm. um trees and so we know to go to peter who's the forestry guy when we need some timber and so we go walk about i needed to build a a chicken structure not that long ago it's not quite the same as an oxford um, college but anyway so I go <laughs> across to Peter and, and tell him what it is that I, I need some timber for and we go walking in the forest and he picks out the particular trees that he thinks would be appropriate for that job mm. um, similarly you know when I needed to get something that was a little bit more substantial for the house we would walk deeper into the forest and we'd find the older trees that were w- would have the suitability for that, and he and he'd tag them. He'd say, "Come back tomorrow," and there we, there it was the tree was on the edge, ready to be picked up, and and I and I'd take it away. And it was a there's something kind of amazing about that when you in your home, and you're touching that piece of wood that you know where it's come from, where it's grown, who's grown it, and mm. and and being involved in the process of respectfully harvesting it. And you have a different relationship with the space and the place and the home. It's not just a, a, a house, a commodity. It is a, it's a living thing that it has a life and a story that stretches way before it became that and, and will continue on with the sense of being much more further on as well and then the, the richness of that story. So I, I totally um, agree with you about this whole concept of, that the most important part is the process and the relational, the re- relationships that you build, the relational process that happens within permaculture. I mean, the, my experience of being involved in um, permaculture application from the start with city farms and community gardens have seen that sort of connection and the uh, the ownership. <laughs> my background was in landscape architecture, and I think I escaped mm-hmm. it because it just felt like it was doing it for someone else and and creating spaces that people consume as a part from being connected to. And and so that bigger picture too of wanting to offer something that was making a positive contribution of regenerating the planet, regenerating communities, just didn't feel like it was capable of coming through that. And so I wonder what maybe you've, you've kind of talked a little bit around it, but what is the bigger picture for you of like what, what, inside is the the motivating force for wanting to do this kind of work where does that come from mm. and how would you how would you describe that <laughs> no just a small question <laughs> yeah yeah well it's interesting because i've been thinking about this a lot recently i just saw the movie kiss the ground mm. that maybe you've seen uh, i worked with those people a little bit and when we were f- first watching it I sort of grumpily said to my wife, I've been talking about this for 30 years. And she um, she said, well, that's one way of talking about it. You could also see it as the time has come that people are finally paying attention. And there is this beautifully produced movie and using the word regenerative that, you know, when we started Regenesis, nobody used. And, um, you know, Really, all of this comes from my childhood. It's like you talking about experiencing nature with your children. And I was lucky enough to grow up on the edge, <coughs> excuse me, on the edge of the city, on the edge of the suburbs, really. There was still forests and fields and farmlands all around, and there was a forest right behind our house. And I spent most of my life there, and it got me really interested in um, how did the original peoples here live? And I became kind of obsessed with learning about the original peoples and found this little paperback book. I was probably about my son's age, about nine. And I found this little book, Black Elk Speaks. And in the book, he tells about this great vision he had when he was a little boy. And in it, he talks about the flowering tree, the tree that's at the center of all things, that's alive and blooms and shelters all beings like, uh, uh, prairie hen shelters its chicks and how from that view he saw how the world was a hoop of many hoops 
It's like the, the face of a sunflower, right? Those interlocking hoops creating one great hole. And he talks about how he was shown um, that the tree had withered and that he his mission in life was to find, to make the tree bloom again. And he felt as if he had failed. And being a little kid, I took his words really directly in. He says, maybe look for it somewhere. There's a root of the tree that's still alive. Find it and nurture it that it will grow and bloom and fill with singing birds again. And so that's really what has motivated all of my work all of these years. And that's why it's Flowering Tree Permaculture is the institute that I co-founded. And um the name of that place that's in the little video, 30 years greening the desert flowering tree. That's mm. a pattern mind. Mm. So can you tell us a little bit more about what you what you've been doing at Flowering Tree Permaculture? Because this idea of greening the desert is something that's really important mm. around the world as we're seeing desertification spread. And you know, it's particularly important here in you know, in places like Australia too, because we're we're mostly dry and getting drier, and 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 uh, well, more extremes here in the subtropics. You know, we spend most of our year in in dry, even though it sounds like it should be wet and lush. It's mostly not. <laughs> and so, this idea of you know greening greening the desert and and positively transforming landscapes, regenerating landscapes. Uh, through this work, I think is is something that's that's really important to explore. So I wonder whether you might just be able to describe a little bit about what it was that you, what it is, what it sure. was that you've you've done there to to make that change. Yeah. So um, I had done a permaculture design course in what nineteen eighty six or something like that, and. Um, married a Native American woman from San Pablo, Pueblo, Roxanne Swensel. And um, we began to apply some of these things. And then I did a second course with Bill Mollison in um, Arizona, somewhere in the late eighties. And so began this dual task of looking at what people had done there traditionally, what species they had used, what were the native plants um, and trying to apply all the permaculture principles in this place. And it was um, relatively small, three quarters of an acre. We had rainwater catchment, we had municipal water, and we had an acequia irrigation ditch. Mm-hmm. And um, worked on creating a food forest in the high desert, which is cold and dry and hot and poor soils and the like. Um, and it did it, you know, it was all weeds when we started and then it became better weeds. And then it was all these little sticks in amongst the weeds. And um, the third year after we planted all these little trees, the acequia was broken and they got no water. But all those years they had grown their roots and then they were able to grow and they didn't particularly need that water. And it was very impressive. And then Rox and I broke up, oh, 20 some years ago now. And so I was there about nine years and it's just continued to grow and prosper. And um, I made this little video about it a few years ago. And the beginning of the video is zooming in on Google Earth. You see the dry Southwest and then you see this little postage stamp green food forest. And at first I was kind of proud of it. And then in the middle of the night I woke up and realized it was a symbol of failure that I didn't just want to make a model and show it could be done. I wanted to transform the way people saw and lived with their land. And it should have disappeared like the first blades of grass in a meadow or the first trees in a forest. It should be a sea of food forests that is just maybe the oldest bit of. And it did not. And um, it made me realize that some of these things I'm talking about I was really good at designing a food forest, but I didn't even think about designing a process for creating a food forest that made everybody understand it, made them engage with it, made them have ownership in it, 
mm-hmm. um, so that it would change people's minds and change the way they ways they lived. And it was a real lesson to me how materialistic I am and how mechanical, mechanistic I am. I was thinking, I will build, it's this thing we say all the time, build it and they will come or prove that it can be done and then everyone will do it. And I had that fantasy when I was an early Permi that I'll just show that we can do this and everybody will do it. And it does not work that way. Yeah, well, it, I guess that's a thing, isn't it? The, having, the, having the demonstration garden um, and it's, you know, it's something that is still really uh, common in terms of what, what I hear all the time. But what you're saying is that not that we don't need those spaces, that there's something else completely other that we need to be paying attention to in in creating those things, which is the way that it's done, the way that it, it enriches the relationships with with the community and beyond do you maybe want to just talk a little bit about that a bit yeah. more i know you have already but say if you were if you were starting fresh on a project like that <laughs> how differently would you do that now so um you know there's a lot of people who'd be listening to this who are in the process of, of starting their own places and wanting to become uh people who are activating change and and educators and so i think in order to kind of shift it from just creating a spot and teaching from there what what's what's that other aspect of it that you would encourage people to explore and to bring into what they're doing yeah um so this is really central to all this work we've been doing with regenesis is that it's mostly been in development projects and one of the first things we're working on is getting people to realize it's not about your project It's about the community your project is within, that you cannot regenerate. No project is regenerative. You can help to develop the capabilities for the place to regenerate itself. So two little stories. Um, When my oldest son was little, I was holding him and he was sleeping. And having built stuff all my life, I was thinking how I would build his miraculous body. And I'd frame him up, I'd put all his bones together with tendons and ligaments, and I'd run all his veins and arteries and his uh, circulatory system, and I'd install all his organs, and I'd sheath them up with skin and fill them with blood and water and food and start them up. And it made me realize that this is how I think about designing and making anything. If it's a curriculum, if it's a garden, if it's a school, if it's a nonprofit, if it's a business, if it's whatever. I design it, I make it, I start it up. And nature doesn't do that with anything. His body was built by carrying on the processes it still carries on. Metabolizing food and water and moving about, right? Just like the river wasn't dug and then the tap was turned on, it was the water flowing that made the river. So that's a a key shift in how I try to think about things. So what are the existing processes that we are trying to reorient Not what is the thing I'm going to make and start, and it's the idea, silver bullet. Um, This morning, working with these folks from Rwanda, I told them the story of stone soup, right? Where these soldiers come into this town, everybody's doors are locked, no one will welcome them in. They get a big pot filled with water and start to cook three rocks, right? And people come, what are you doing? Oh, we're making stone soup. Oh. Stone soup, I want to know how to do that because there's plenty of stones around. And they, oh, some salt would be good, some onions, right? You know the story. And what they have done is they've put a vision into everybody's mind of a big pot of food whenever they want it because they could just get stones, right? And then everybody begins to see how they can contribute to that reality coming about. And to me, that's what regeneration, permaculture is all about, is how do we actually look in depth enough into a place, who it is, right? The the most destructive part of the industrial revolution is that we've seen and treated everything as if it was the same, whether it's school students, or women, or workers, 
or a board or a piece of meat or a vegetable or a piece of land, we treat it as the same or we make it, right? First thing we do is flatten it, right? Put the board through the plane, right? Make sure the kids fit in the box. And the beauty of the living world is that every one of us is unique. Every piece of land, every person, every human being, and every place. And so that's a core to our work at Regenesis. How do we help us understand the water we're swimming in that is invisible to us, to understand the unique potential of this place, how we could envision the potential of this place into the future, and how we can each be called to contribute to that shared vision. And some of us it might be gardening, some of us might be foresting, some of it might be cooking, some of us might be business, some of it might be schooling. Um, but it's Ben Haggard, who's one of my co-founders at Regenesis. We did permaculture together for a long time. He said, our failure as permies was teaching classes everybody wanted to be us instead of learning to be a permaculture minded lawyer and a permaculture minded teacher and a perm right that it really is how do we have this worldview and this way of looking at things that whatever our skills and our callings are we can contribute to the health of living systems that are whole and increasingly whole and increasingly developing and evolved mm -hmm. <clears throat> i love that I, and i think that's you know that that's exactly it's what people need to hear, I think, because it's this mm. sense that, you know, permaculture is about going and having a homestead or being a permaculture designer or a permaculture teacher. It's, 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 well, it can be that, but it's so much, it's so much more. It's, it's about, like you're saying, it's about bringing it in, inwards and weaving it wherever you, wherever you are, wherever your passion and your interest lies. And that it, that is, that is a way of seeing, isn't it? It's a, it's mm. a, it's a paradigm. It's a, it's a it's a way of of engaging and relating and connecting. I wanted to sort of take a, a step back though, because there's something you're talking there about the the bigger picture, like the stone soup. So I'm thinking my mind is at places like community gardens, for example, where they've been going for a while and they've come to a point where they're just maybe a bit stuck. Mm. That they don't have the stone soup. And so from the work that you do with, with Regenesis, uh, how do you help communities identify what their stone soup is mm. in order that they then see how they can contribute to that? Because I think we can all have a sense of what we can do here, but, like, what's that, what's that next step? What's that bigger picture? How... And, you know, taking that out from smaller projects to thinking about, you know, a more societal level, what is our societal stone soup that we can hold that image of so that we can be stepping up and speaking up and contributing at a, at a different level? Yeah. Um, So I'm going to answer your question using a framework that we use a lot at Regenesis. So it's three nested holes, and in the middle one is vitality, right? So these are requirements to be regenerative. So whether it's a houseplant or a business or a cafe or a piece of land or a community, it must be vital, right? There has to, part of what you're talking about, these, these community gardens that sort of go flat after a bit, is the spirit, right? That spirit that started, that was fun and exciting and we're gonna be creative and do all this cool stuff. After a while, it starts to fade. And it's because you've uh, you've accomplished the things you decided to accomplish mm -hmm. or you just accomplished what you could accomplish, right? Um, but in a changing world, you've got to constantly be changing and developing or you lose that vitality. Right. There's some of the most successful projects after a while. It happens to all of them. Um, Village Homes in Davis, California, which is a beautiful place. It doesn't have the same kind of vitality it once did because it doesn't have the same kind of mission. And what are we going to actually be doing? So that mission, that calling, that um, regenerated spirit 
is really essential to a regenerative project. And then that vitality at the next ring out has everything to do with how viable the plant, the animal, the business, the garden is in what's around it, right? And we all know of great businesses or communities that they were incredibly viable and then the world moved on, right? So even Kodak Film, yeah, when the world moved on, what had made them incredibly viable was no longer viable. And that's true for all of us. It's here in this country, small bookstores went through that. When the big box bookstores came along, they couldn't compete with them just selling books. And they had to realize that what they were offering was a really different value, it had to do with a community gathering space around ideas. Yeah. And because the big box stores are based on selling books for the cheapest, they can't compete with Amazon. Right. And so that it's about how we have vitality and regenerate that vitality. Right. And that viability and continue to regenerate that viability in a changing world. And that brings us to the third ring, which is the capacity for evolution. That all of our projects, if we do not build into them, the development, the ongoing development of the capacity for evolution, you cannot maintain that vitality and that viability. And that's why the, you know, the design that is just a piece of paper with drawings on it is not going to maintain vitality and viability or instill the capacity for evolution into it. Mm -hmm. Right. One of the things I've taught and visited so many old hippie communities, right? intentional communities, and they're all kind of fading. People are getting old, people are dying, young people leave, young people don't come. It's not that fun, right? And it's a problem of succession. And one of the things we know, human communities that have figured out lineages, mm -hmm. um, things not only are passed on for many generations, they continue to evolve and grow. So one of our roles as permaculture teachers, I believe, is to ensure that our students excel beyond us. Because if not, it's only a downward slope. And it's one of the main things that I see in the whole permaculture world and permaculture education is that it's like a game of telephone. That, oh, I didn't quite get this from my teacher, so then I don't teach it, so then none of my students get that. And, it becomes this devolutionary process if you're focused on the information. Mm -hmm. If you focus on the underlying patterns, everybody can have new insights about how they're applied and how to use them and how to use them to understand people and places and other living beings, right? Mm -hmm. And so that is the biggest change, I would say, is... How do we be thinking that our design and implementation process is primarily a capability and capacity building process? An educational process is one of the ways to think about it. So that when we're gone, the garden continues to grow more and more and more and spread. Right? Mm. Yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely critical in what we need to be doing because we also, it's not like you're saying, we don't want it just to to be sort of passed on, passed on in a in a downward side, but actually to to kind of myceliate from that. It just just keeps amplifying in in ways and in directions that we don't know and taking on life and form of its own and, and creating its own vitality where wherever it is. And that's kind of a little bit what uh what, what we're seeing happening now in a lot of um, the refugee camps, which is mm. it's just absolutely remarkable. And I, I wanted to sort of circle back around to where you were talking about um, vitality and viability and that um, capacity for evolution, because there was something in there that I that I wanted to ask you about, like practically how how do you make that happen? So let's go back, say, to that <laughs> example of community gardens or eco villages mm -hmm. and and you know aging community um, communities that you've experienced. So where you notice that that vitality is fading, where the, the spark has 
you know, it that the that sense of accomplishment. Like I think that's the you know, that's a really important point. There's this plateauing, you know, we achieved it. That's great. But like once you've achieved that bigger set of goals as a community, how how do you move past? You know, there's a kind of a, a settling in. It's like, okay, we did this, that's really great. We're what we're okay. But there's there's always that the new edges that we need to move out to to bring new life into it. And I just wonder if you could reflect on some maybe examples of of, of practically how you can reactivate something that has plateaued or is starting to sort of fade. How to how to invite new life into that. So it's it's all around us, right? Is you are talking about an ecological successional process. And we see it in our cities, right? There's the cool, edgy neighborhoods that the artists live in, and there's immigrants that live there and people of different sexualities. And um, it's a little sketchy and a little scary and kind of exciting and creative and fun. And then after a while, it becomes gentrified and yuppified. And um, it's still kind of cool, but it's increasingly boring and then eventually it's senescent, right? So all the, all the niches are filled that it becomes increasingly simplified. It becomes increasingly rigid and stable and brittle. And so this idea of a climax forest or climax community that we'd always talked about, scientists are now calling senescent, right? And it's the subclimax communities that are most species diverse and most productive, right? And this is one of the reasons why native peoples all around the world use forms of disturbance, fire, flooding, cutting, harvesting, um, to move to a new subclimax, right? It doesn't just go back to the previous one, it moves on to another one. That's, that's the capacity for evolution. So it's one of the roles of human beings is that we cannot, only fall in love with anything, right? You can fall in love with a cliff, a rock, a tree, a bird, a person, a, a car, right? But we can appreciate them, right? We've turned these tiny little stony, fuzzy fruits into peaches and these tiny marble-sized things into brandy wine tomatoes, yeah? You know? Or it's what we do, right? We help children turn into these beautiful human beings or Poets look for that one line or that one word that will bring out something and make it obvious, right? Um, and so there's a couple of ways of doing what we're talking about. One of them has to do with some form of disturbance, mm -hmm. right? And human beings for eons have known this. And I have a friend, Bill Plotkin, who said, ceremony is disturbance. Mm -hmm. It takes you out of your habitual patterns of life, if it's going sitting on the hill and praying for four days for taking the Sabbath off or fasting or feasting or going on pilgrimage, you're breaking the patterns that you're used to. So ceremony is one of the ways we break our patterns. And ceremonies can be as much a habitual pattern as well. Right? I was just going to say, in my mind, I have ceremony as being actually something that is, is a pattern that is continued over time as opposed to breaking a pattern. That's a really that's a really interesting shift. Well, it's some it's different than your daily life. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. You're not working. You're not eating. You're eating a lot. You're praying. You're singing. You're whatever it is. You're all going out into the forest together. You don't do that every day. Yeah. It may have been. So there's a one of the things. So there's three aspects that are really important. One is that to be consciously developmental. To know that we're going to plateau and we need to create the next stage of evolution or we're going to lose the vitality and viability, mm -hmm. right? So being aware of that, that is a pattern in the living world, including human organizations. So knowing that. So setting up these periodic disturbances, right? Whether it's taking the Sabbath off or seasonal festivities or whatever it is. Um, and there's a kind of need for an intensity and a periodicity and a longevity mm -hmm. so that um, all of these communities, they've had some way 
Uh, knowing that there's a tendency toward rigidity and codifying and ownership and all of that, how do we have that jubilee? How do we have that ground fire, that cool ground fire, not the ground fire that wipes it all out, that redistributes things, gets us to see things in a different way, um, and we can practice it, mm -hmm. right? So whether it's a yoga practice or a legal practice or an landscape architecture practice, it's actually you're developing your capabilities by practicing a permaculture practice, right? And so in all these ways, it's a kind of regenerative practice and you have to do it with the garden, right? The garden is gonna to start to go down, you lose species, the soil gets compacted or it gets too acidic or too alkaline and you have to move things around and it's always somewhat painful. It's like, and we've always planted peas there. Right. We've always had that hedgerow there or the kids love those berries. You can't take those. But right. That it happens in our minds as well. Yeah. Right. So I love that idea do... of being a practice. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, and that is that you know, what we talk about being lifelong learning, you know, that kind of terminology. But mm -hmm. it is it is about not just learning it, but actually being in, in the practice and being in that full engagement with it to know when and where shifts can happen or how to, to interact in order to bring that change. Yeah. And, and maybe maybe you could talk a little bit more about change making. I know we're we're almost at our time. There's two big questions I wanted to ask you. And maybe we can just maybe that if I ask them both together, we could wrap that up together. Um, so one is about that process of change making as opposed to creating conditions for change. Because often we head into a guy, you know, we're change makers, we're going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Whereas whether whether you see that as a really actually what we need to be doing is creating conditions mm -hmm. for change because things always change is kind of like what Nora Basin talks about a mm -hmm. lot. And the other sort of just sort of uh, question that I wanted to bring in here is what what do you see being sort of the highest potential of permaculture in the world today. Mm -hmm. uh, so which kind of relates to the change making, I suppose, that that we need in the world today as well. Yeah. Um, well, this is maybe a weird direction to go, but you know that in both Hebrew and Aramaic, the word we translate as sin means to miss the mark. Like when you're shooting an arrow or throwing a spear, you're just off the mark that it's not about damnation. Yeah. And um, change is constant, but I think the question is is it a developing change or a devolving change? Mm -hmm. And um, we can instigate both. Right, you clear cut landscape and it gets poorer and poorer and poorer, and the people get poorer and poorer, right? And so, um, our first art and skill as human beings is as trackers, right? It's the roots of science observation what are the patterns? Where am I going to place myself so that this comes to me, or I'm not going to get flooded, or whatever it is. So, um, unfortunately, much of permaculture has gotten to where people are really proud of their acupuncture needles. Look how cool this needle is and polishing it up and teaching people about this needle, this needle, this needle, this needle, and we're all one trick ponies, right? But the acupuncture is the first thing they do is they feel your pulses, right? They don't just, oh, here's the point I use on everybody all the time, right? They're tracking the patterns to find what is that least change for the greatest effect that will rearrange the patterns of flow that create a different manifestation. And so whether or not that's change makers, I'm not sure, but I think it really is helping people to see differently. It's that those few words, those images. Um, so I've been, lucky enough to be part of this Native American permaculture course for 20 years. And now um, they don't need me anymore. And so I, I was respectfully uninvited a few years back, right? Because they have enough Native American teachers to teach it, which is fantastic, right? 
And they even stopped using the word permaculture because they ran into some difficulties there. But early on when we were doing it, we were up at Picaris Pueblo. And this older man got up in front of everybody and there was, you know, a bunch of young Native Americans um, and a bunch of Native folks from all over the Americas and some non-Native folks. And um, I don't know if you know, it's probably similar to Aboriginal folks, right? That um, incarceration, all of the bad things, the rates are far higher among Native American populations than the population in general, even black and brown people in general. And he, uh, he looked at everybody, he said, make a fist, hold it up, yeah, hold it up. And so everybody made a fist and said, see how your knuckles go up and down, up and down, just like the mountain ridge, just like the river in the valley. See how your thumb and forefinger spiral, just like the water behind a rock where the trout sits. And then he pointed to every one of us, he said, no square people, we all belong. And he, he made me realize that here we were teaching all these ways to do. And if we're doing, 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 but all the problems in the world are our fault because we don't belong, mm. it's a totally different reality than, no, we belong I have the tracks of the mountain and the river on my hand as undeniably as my grandmother's nose. Mm. I have the tracks of the water and the wind in my hand, undeniably. And when we put ourselves in the picture that we are here with roles to play and we've forgotten our original instructions, that changes the game entirely. It's not about moves on a chessboard. It's about how do we play our role that the world is dying for us to play? Mm. And for me, that is the shift. If we could just make the shift from being these outside operators to inside children of the living earth mm. that are here to play a role that is inspiring, is revitalizing, right? It makes us all far more viable and um, gives us the capacity to evolve. That, yeah, we've done all this stuff that's destructive, but that's because we're in ignorance. Right? We're, it's a trauma response to trauma. Mm. And just that, that idea, too, of being... So from that observation perspective, it's not, it's not that separate observation of it's being within it and and observing with and noticing the 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 relationship between us and our our place and our community that we don't exist in isolation and sort of like looking at it separately i think it's that bring like you're just saying then bringing ourselves deeply back within it and, and as a in a way of being in place and connecting with place and, and acknowledging our sense of, of belonging. Because I think quite often there's this deep sense that we don't belong, mm. you know, I mean, particularly as part of a maybe a, a colonising group, you know, there's the, all the guilt and attack. So we sort of there's still this separation and a doing mm. approach and there's a, there's a lot of shift that needs to happen in that, you know, and healing healing that way of, of being as well. And we, as environmentalists and environmental educators, our messaging has been terrible. If you tell a child they're bad and stupid and ugly, they will believe they're bad and stupid and ugly. If you tell people that everything is their fault, they'll believe it's their fault. And if you tell them they're beautiful and wonderful and capable and they are entirely able to make beauty in the world and, make, and that's who they'll be mm. and that's what they'll do mm. well that's a beautiful place to end our conversation today thank you so much for joining me joel oh Thanks. my pleasure and i just want to say one of the things i've been spending a lot of time on during this plague is um, doing a lot of coaching on Zoom. Mm. And um, 
it's an easy way to reach me. And if people want to contact me through um, the contact page of patternmind.org, um, it's a great way to get a hold of me. And I, it's nothing better than to talk to people all around the world that are doing their best. Yeah, great. So I'll put down the links for all of this in the show notes, um, where to find you and um, links to, to, to your work. Um, thank you again, Joel. It's been an absolute pleasure to have this conversation with you this morning or your afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and it's, and it's just been really great to, to connect. Like I said at, at the start, of, you know, I've known of your work for a long, long time and, you know, watch, you know, this, we're all around the world and I, something about, like you're saying with this, with this time now that because of Zoom, Many of us who have been in our various places are actually connecting more than we ever have before. And I, I, I'm really grateful for that opportunity to have a chance to really reach out and connect with a lot, lot more people. It's really, it's absolutely enriching. Yeah, thank you. It was funny last night I was thinking about this and I was mostly thinking of questions I wanted to ask you <laughs> and things I wanted to hear about your work, but we'll have to do that in another show. your part too. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Joel, and um, have a have a beautiful evening, and hopefully we'll talk again soon. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks. So thanks for tuning in to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast today. It's been a real pleasure to have your company. I invite you to subscribe and receive notification of each new weekly episode with more wonderful stories, ideas, inspiration, and common sense for living and working regeneratively. And call positive permaculture thinking and design into action in this changing world. I'm including a transcript below and a link also to my four-part permaculture series, really looking at what is permaculture and how to make it your livelihood too. So join me again in the next episode where we talk with another fascinating guest. I look forward to seeing you there.